name is David, and it's an honor to be with you. Thank you so much for joining this seminar. I'm going to talk a lot and talk quickly because i got a lot of content I want to try to bring to you. But um, uh, thank you for coming to this session. Uh, I'm a pastor's kid, um, grew up in a pastor's family, and, uh, and then I spent 16 years um, as a pastor in Colorado um, on staff at a church uh, and then uh, planted a church, uh, Radiant Church in Kansas City. I have a wife and four kids, and... Um, and my goal in this session is to talk to you about making disciples of your children. And so my goal uh, is there's so many things under the banner of family that you could go after. Uh, we could go after marriage. We could talk about creating a culture, all kinds of different ways we could come at this. But uh, my goal is to, uh, is to really help you be intentional with your family. And so um, I'm going to pray in just a moment. Um, and then I'm going to tell a couple stories and then I'm going to give you some Bible, and then I'm going to give you seven habits in discipling your family, all right? So that's kind of the macro picture of where we're going to go. Uh, Father, we love you, and I thank you, Lord Jesus, for each of these pastors and leaders. And God, I thank you for their children and their marriages, and I thank you for this season. God, each one of us, <clears throat> whatever season, whether it's adult children, teenage children, elementary, or even babies, and even those, Lord Jesus, that are uh, looking at kids in the future, I ask, Lord, that each one of these kids would walk with you all their days. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would strengthen each of these parents as we navigate these waters of parenting and leading the local church and raising our family at the same time. And I pray that not one of their children would be lost. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give them strategic ideas and plans and ways, Lord, to lead their children to Jesus. And God, I just pray when they feel discouraged, when they're dealing with the internet and friends and not enough money and, and, and people leaving the church and awful things said about them that their children hear and just the whole process of trying to pastor and parent at the same time, I pray that you would bless them and strengthen them. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would prosper them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, so my father is uh, 75 and during COVID uh, in November, um, he, uh, he went into the hospital, and uh, at first, we just thought, you know, that it was going to be uh, kind of a challenging COVID like somebody else and then come out, um, but after 26 days of being in the COVID unit, um, he was progressively getting worse and worse over the, over the course of that time, and uh, when he went in... Um, my wife, actually, her name's Renata, and she said, David, I feel like we're supposed to jump on Zoom and pray with your dad tonight. And at that time, we mobilized some of my dad's friends. My dad's been 50 years in ministry. And uh, so we mobilized some of my dad's friends. And so you had kind of my family, some of the people from our church, and then some of my dad's 70-ish you know, year old friends. And we started just to pray with my dad. He's on his phone. He's in the COVID unit. And we're just praying for him and not knowing the severity of it. Um, but then night two, uh, we invited my, I'm a triplet, so if you don't know what that is, it's the equivalent of being born in a litter. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, my parents had the shock of their lives in 1976 where they had triplets. They were aiming for one kid, accidentally had three. We call it Sovereign. And there's David, Dana, Deborah, four years later, my brother, Dan. My mom's name is Debbie. My dad's name is Hal. And... Um, uh, but we mobilized my family and we all started to pray and believe for dad. And so he would hold his phone um, isolated in the COVID unit and the news got progressively worse. We had little wins where the doctors would give us a little bit of good news. And then, um, uh, but, but, but we began to just, just experience the doctors giving us worse and worse and worse news. So much so that the doctors who knew that my dad was life-giving, smiling, talking to them about Jesus in the hospital in Kansas City, that's where I live. Um, my dad would tell them that we were believing for a miracle and the doctors who loved him because of his kindness but thought that he was living a little bit um, clueless as to reality said, your family is living in a state of denial um, and told him that, uh, that there was a 99.9% .9 chance that he wouldn't live. And um, so he was looking at his options of should he go on the ventilator, should he uh, go into comfort care. And having those conversations with Zoom, uh, over Zoom with us about what to do. And uh, my dad would talk about believing in faith that 
uh, he would go home. And the doctor said to him, Mr. Perkins, the only way that you will go home uh, is if we build a hospital around your house. Uh, and told him about, you've got, you're living on these 60 liters of oxygen. It's not going to happen. Um, and my dad had COVID plus pneumonia, pneumonia plus um, pulmonary embolism uh, plus um, ARDS. And he said, your, your lungs uh, will not recover. And so I'm dealing with this. And then I've got these FaceTimes with my dad where I just... I just sit there, it's in my prayer journal, just says FaceTimes with dad and um, thought that it might be my last conversations with my dad. And um, on day 26, uh, they took him to comfort care. He chose comfort care over the ventilator. And uh, he'd been in isolation for 26 days. And they decided to let my mom come to the hospital. They weren't allowing people into the hospital on December 10th to come see him uh, before he passed away. And she went into the hospital, walked into the room, sat down, or hugged him, sat down, talked to him, prayed with him. And the doctor came in um, and took his oxygen levels and turned his oxygen level from 65 down to 50, down to 40, down to 30, down to 20, down to 10. And that day the doctor came in and said, Mr. Perkins, I can't explain what happened. And he said, I believe in a God who's a healer. And that person said, you've experienced um, the doctor, not a nurse, not a nurse practitioner. The doctor said, this is a miracle. I've never seen anything like it. We have it on, we have it actually in audio. Uh, and uh, we, we created a documentary. Um, if you search Radiant Church, uh, God of Miracles, my sisters, my triplet sisters, my brother and I, uh, we told the story with my parents of God healing my dad. And, uh, and then the doctor said, uh, I, don't, I, I, know, I, I know that this is what you believe about God doing a miracle. And she said, I'm not sure about faith, but she said, but you must be one with the universe because this is impossible. And um, to my dad, of course, took that moment to say, well, let me tell you who made the universe, you know. <laughs> And uh, so I'm still living in it. I actually um, can't stop telling that story because, um, you know, my dad, uh, how do you get to that? Like, how do you get to the point where you're 75 years old and 26 nights, and I'm not exaggerating a night, 26 night, four kids, we're triplets, we're all 44, and my brother Dan's 39, all have great Christian spouses, all of us. Uh, and I don't say this, uh, I'm only in this moment where I'm talking about discipling your family, and I say this not to uh, brag on family, but I do want to brag on my dad. Because how do you get to the point where you're 75, and you have all four kids and their spouses and grandkids sitting in living rooms, canceling everything every night in order to just pray and cry out in intercession for healing for, for Poppy? How do you get that? What kind of legacy is that? How, how do you go there? Well, my dad, when he uh, found out that he was going to have triplets, he began to pray. And he was a young pastor at that time living in New Jersey. And he had been studying the way that Jesus discipled. And so he was looking at the way that Jesus asked his disciples questions. And he was looking at the way that Jesus was conversational and relational. And he was looking at just even the specific questions that Jesus would ask Peter. So you, you find moments where Jesus is saying things like, who do you say that I am? Peter, do you love me? Do you believe in what I'm saying? Just questions where he's, Jesus is trying to get these top tier guys, meaning top tier relationally. I'm not saying that the fishermen and the tax collectors are the most influential of the day. I'm saying that relationally, they're the ones that he's decided to invest in. And the ones that are closest to him, he's intentional with. And so the way that Jesus did ministry was to really pour his life into the one, John, the three, Peter, James, and John, and then the 12. And so my dad locked in with what I want to do is, is David, Dana, and Deborah, and Dan are my Peter, James, John, and Andrew, <laughs> you know? He just tried to have three, but accidentally had four. You know what I mean? Like, like and tried to intentionally disciple. And 
I just tell you that story because I, 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 I want to invite you, not necessarily to embrace the methods that my dad embraced, but to embrace the intentionality. Every time you start giving people specific methods and push back and say, well, one size doesn't fit all. And I, I agree with that. That's awesome. What I've experienced now, I started in ministry at 18, I'm 44 now, is I've just watched that there's so many that just don't necessarily have a strategy or a plan. Just kind of leave it up to sovereignty and just say, we hope it all works out. And I want to invite you to care enough to create a plan. I want to, and I'm going to give you Renata and my plan. It's not just like my parents' plan, Hal and Debbie. Uh, but I want to invite you to just have a plan. I want to invite you to just go after intentionally discipling your kids. There's a whole lot of sessions on marriage. This is not the, uh, that one. I'll do that one. I'm actually this Sunday sitting with my wife. We're talking about marriage and family on Mother's Day. That's a whole nother thing. Today, I am focusing in on you as a parent, discipling your kids. Because I want, in my life, I want to end up where my dad ended up. And by the way, he was at church yesterday, uh, both services, front row, cheering me on, uh, and he's doing great. He's healthy. Uh, he's, he is uh, not quite as, he was, you know, he was a, star, he was a great athlete in, in uh, college. He's not quite the athlete he was post-COVID at 75, but he is alive. And uh, I sound like, and so, so I'm just thanking God for that. So here's, I'm going to give you just a little bit of Bible now, and then we'll go after some habits, and then uh, I'll let you do Q&A uh, if we can get there. Um, so first idea is this, prioritize your family as your first church, as your first church. So I love that you're pastoring a church. I love that you're leading a church. I think that's awesome. Or associate kids, youth, worship, whatever you're doing. But your first priority is your family. Your family's your first church. When I was 16, um, high school, had a mullet living in Oklahoma City. And uh, my sisters were like, as triplets, went to a public high school, 2,500 kids. And my sisters were cool. Like my sisters had all the dudes after them. They were just cool. I was struggling a little bit. Uh, I had braces, mullet. Girls didn't like me like they liked my sisters. My sisters, to be like, I'm the tallest of the triplets. If you're a girl, no problem to be 5'5". Five five. You a dude, it's rough. And so uh, uh, we look alike. But anyway, so uh, we... We, uh, I had this girl that I liked when I was 16. She was about a head taller than me. And um, I, on a, I, I, my dad used to systematically take each one of us out. So I'm going to get to this. But uh, one of the things that he decided to do was to take each one of us out uh, starting when we were five. So when we reached kindergarten age. So he took my mom, Debbie, out on Monday. And every Monday uh, was Debbie Day. And then she, he took me out every Tuesday. Dana every Wednesday, Deborah every Thursday, Dan every Friday. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So by the time I was 16, I had 11 years of Tuesday night was my night. And, um, and it was usually, when I was really little, it was 30 minutes, and we'd play basketball to get together or something. Or when I was, I mean, before I could play basketball, it was just sitting over ice cream. Um, then it was, you know, it kind of changed over the course of time as I got older. Um, but when I, but... On a Tuesday night when I was 16, I just had a powerful moment that really embodies this concept. Um, my dad worked in a church government form where he reported to the church board. And the church board would have meetings where ultimately my dad reported to them. His job was contingent upon if they wanted to keep him hired. And so I don't know what kind of church government you got, but that's the kind that my dad had. And so uh, my dad, uh, on a Tuesday night, uh, we're sitting at a Bennigan's in northwest Oklahoma City, and I'm sitting there drinking a Coke, and uh, I am crying. I know that's embarrassing to say. Lost some man points when I tell you that. Um, lost man points when I told you that I had a mullet. But uh, <laughs> if you can't grow a beard, you grow a mullet. Anyway, and uh, so I'm sitting there, and uh, I'm just bawling telling my dad the story about how I like this girl, she doesn't like me back, it's a big deal, you know, high school is dramatic, and, and, uh, and my dad's just listening, my dad's real soft spoken, it's real soft spoken, real quiet, just asking these questions, and then he gets up, I've been going for about 45 minutes, he walks over to a payphone, yeah, 1992, different era, <laughs> and uh, comes back, and he says, uh, all right, David, we've got the rest of the night, and I said, well, what about your board meeting? And he said, I canceled the board meeting. Sorry. I said, Dad, you can't cancel your board meeting. That's your church. That's your job. 
And he looked at me, and he just, not dramatic, like loud, obnoxious, big-voiced dad. My dad is soft-spoken. He was a math teacher before he was a pastor. He's very articulate, very precise, speaks very quietly. And he said, son, you're my first church. That's what I want you to get. You're my first church. So I got a lot. I got, we, got, we, got, we got churches we got to lead. We got buildings we got to buy. We got elders we got to. We got prayer meetings we got to do. We got sermons we got to write. We got videos. We got to figure out Zoom and web streaming. We got a lot we got to do. But in the midst of all that you got going on, the best mark you can make on your kids is you're my first church. And so I want to invite you to schedule first what matters most. Put Jesus number one, and then figure out a strategy for your family. My mom uh, was a speech and drama queen, you know, in, in college. And then she had the shock of her life when she spent 81 hours in labor delivering triplets. And um, she didn't know she was going to have triplets, so she had uh, a boy, David, me, and then my sister, Dana. She went into labor not knowing that she had three in there. And um, the doctor said to her, 1976, said, hey, Debbie, um, will you buy me a hot fudge sundae if there's another baby coming today? And she didn't understand what he was talking about. She's like, what? He's like, Debbie, get ready. You're having three. (laughs) And so uh, my mom uh, went into some shock. My dad started groaning and crying that day. And I uh, said, Dad, why are you crying? He said, I thought about three kids hitting college at the same day and just thought my life is over. <laughs> she tells the story about when the triplets, the three of us, when we were like about three. And she'd given the last really four years because we were three years old plus the, the pre- pregnancy of triplets was a long run. And, and, and all the ministry ambitions she had as a, as a conference speaker. And she had wanted to go pursue some of that. And she was stirring soup when she felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to her and said, Debbie, uh, if you'll invest in discipling these kids, they'll go places. Sorry, but you can never go. Crazy part is all four of her kids turn out to be these crazy preachers. (laughs) My brother's here. He's a preacher. My sister Dana is a preacher. My sister Deborah's a preacher. We're all preachers. But my mom, just like my dad, Times are weepy, man, jeez. Uh, just embraced, all right, we're going to be intentional. And I want to invite you just to think through what does it look like. Who's my Peter, James, and John? You got three little, tri- you, got three, you got two kids, three kids, five kids. You got seven, you got one, whatever you got. You probably don't have more than 12. And I just want to invite you just to think about specifically those being, you're discipling them. So it's Jesus discipling you, but, but then you're making it. And, and that's the lens I want to come at it with. We could go family and go lots of different ways. We could go Old Testament. We could look at lots of different angles. But even taking some of the ways that Jesus specifically uh, focused in on his disciples. So for me, my dream is to make my kids my first church. And so I'm looking at, that means that my first church is not my overseers. My, it's not my trustees. It's not the pastor, my associate pastors on my team. It's not my small group. I love all those people. It's not my prayer meetings. And it, it, but here's my, here's my first church. It's, it's, my, it's my family. And, and, and forming my life, my minutes and my dollars to meet that reality. So that it's Renata, who we've been married 21 years. Uh, it's my son Dawson, who is 16, 5'11", uh, and a half. Dark hair, dark eyes. Looks just like his dad. <laughs> not really. <laughs> Olivia, she's 15. Last Sunday, she just preached her first sermon in kids. She wants to be a preacher. Mm. 16-year-old son. He, last year, okay, this is fun. Last year, my son comes to me and he says, hey, dad, um, I got invited to go speak in another city, but I'm not sure if I'm old enough to accept speaking engagements. Um, but they said that they would pay for two flights. Will you be my plus one? That's a good day. When your 16-year-old is like, mm. Because my 16-year-old's leading prayer meetings every day. 
five days a week, Monday through Friday, just crying out to God. I don't tell you that to brag. I tell you that because I want you to believe that with the stuff I'm giving you is multi-generational. I want you to get this, that I was a crazy prayer meeting guy when I was in high school. And I thought maybe I was just this revivalist that God had sovereignly plucked out. But you know what? I, the more I look back, it's when I'm nine years old. My dad's asking questions. So David, quietly, what do you think Jesus thinks? So David, what, could you, what do you think God could do with that high school? David, how does God work? So this is how you feel because those people are making fun of you or there's people rejecting you? How do you think you can make a difference in their lives? So I thought I had all these ideas about, hey, man, we'll get a classroom and we'll cry out for revival and pray for kids. And turns out my dad was helping me love my enemies when I was in seventh grade. Turns out systematically seeding ideas, thoughts, just coaching, just making sure. It's called discipleship. We're always waiting for the big sovereign move. Uh, some experience, the, the, the family that, the, you know, that, the, that has the kid that's beating up my kid, God sovereignly moved them to another city. And we want stuff like that. Let me tell you, all that is, is dreamy and nice, but here's how you get to actually not having the circumstance control how your kids turn out, but just you walking with Jesus and then you're just gently walking, talking, helping them think. Helping them think. So my kids right now, are I, 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 to, by the grace of God, right now they're thriving. By the grace of God, God's doing amazing things. 16, 15, 13, 11. We in the thick of it, baby. <laughs> because this is a generation where I don't know. Right now, I'm not sure how my son has so many 16-year-old girls chasing him down. I didn't ever struggle with that. So I'm like <laughs> trying to figure it out. But it's a, it's a den of lions out there right now, right? So my way of chasing or helping is not like um, rules, law in this family. Here's, here's, here's how I'm leading my kids right now. All right, Doss, we've been, we've been going out together. Liv, we've been, we've been hanging out together one-on-one. Since you were five, and it's their free will choices making decisions because it's connected to, it's connected their relationship with Jesus. You tracking with me? We together? I'm not. I'm not sure we're there yet. We'll get there. Um, but that's that's number one is just to make this plan. I'm gonna prioritize my family. Second idea is speak life. Speak life like the heavenly Father. When we look at um, the way that the Father speaks over the Son. Baptism event, Matthew 3. I think it helps us see how the Father fathered. So what is the Heavenly Father like? First person in the Trinity to the second person in the Trinity. How does, Je- how does the Father lead Jesus? Just look at this. As soon as Jesus was baptized, Matthew 3, 16. He went, up on the wa- he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on himself. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love with whom I'm well pleased. I just want you to see three phrases. This is my son, acceptance. So speaking to your kids, hey, you're mine. I love you so much. You're, accept- you're all right. Let's put some pictures of the family on the wall. This is a safe place. You're accepted. This is my son. You my boy. That's my girl. Well, I mean, and, and zero to five right in there, you're just, I mean, you are training. You are sh- and you're making sure you're getting as much affection, acceptance as you can get in those years. Little tiny kids. The, your mind, you belong. I mean, just that, that concept. This is our family. That you're my daughter. You're my son. We, and then whom I love. That's affirmation. This acceptance, sorry, then affection. Whom I love. I love you. I believe in you. I enjoy you. I love you. This is my son. Whom I love. And then this phrase, with whom I'm well pleased. Looking for the actual things that they do to actually give approval on. So what are, the, what are the little things or big things that they're actually doing so that we can go accepted, affection, affirmation. You're my son. You're my daughter, whom I love. I'm so, that, that last one, I'm so proud of you. Looking at every single, it's so funny. My, I'm just saying this. I know this is probably gonna end up on YouTube, so it's a little embarrassing. And my son overhears this. But my son, uh, when he was about nine, he started saying back to me, Dad, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> well, how did he get that? 
Like, he just heard it so much that he just, like, took it on himself. He's going to be proud of his 35-year-old dad. Did something right, you know, like. And so I'm, I'm just inviting. You know, I, I realize I'm being vulnerable. I realize when I tell you about some of our wins, you got the risk of you thinking that I'm cocky and arrogant. I'm, I'm intentionally being vulnerable and telling you some of the wins, and I'll tell you some of the losses so, so that we can, we can help each other, not because I need a moment to tell you that I'm doing a good job because I'm telling you I'm not – thinking I'm doing a good job. I am in the dogfight. I'm in the battle of a lifetime. I got the culture coming after my kids and I care about them. Like I really like, I don't really care about it. I mean, I care about Renata and my kids really like, I don't care about much else. You know, like I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do the best I can to raise a praying church and let's do, let's reach our city and let's do global evangelism. At the end of the day though, my first church, I'm going to lay my life down right there. Um, so I just want to invite you to think that way. Acceptance. This is my son. Family pictures. Like, you belong here. Family song. We write songs. My mom did it, so I did it. You know, we just, when they were little, we started singing, take me out with my family. Take me out with my friends. We'll sing together and laugh and play. It's going to be a super fun day because it's Dawson Perkins, the leader. Olivia Faith, the princess. Adeline Grace is a movie star. Justice is growling in the back of the car because he was one. And it's mommy passing out Chick-fil-A, daddy screaming hip hooray, let's all start by praising King Jesus for giving us this day, hooray. Then we sing that in the car, Here, here's the why, here's the why, why you belong. All your names are in the song, you're a part of this family, you belong, picture on the wall, your name's in the song, hey, we're all together, you belong, you're, accept, you, you're accepted, you belong. I had was one pastor came up to me uh, co- uh, like, and, and said, Hey, we've never met. I follow you on Instagram. He goes, I really get one thing from your Instagram account. You're a little nervous when you hear something like that, like, oh, dear God, what could this be? And he said, you're really proud of your kids. And I said, <laughs> I cried. You can imagine, you know. I just thought, that's right. Yeah, I am. Yeah, that's, that's what I got. Second one, whom I love. Man, say it, spray it, sign language it, emoji it, say it every day. Um, Renata and I, one of the ways that we did this, just practical, is we just went and uh, we just, we, we, I, I, we went and, we, so we write songs, you know, that's just one, but we got quite a few and we put things up on their beds, over their beds that just have a picture. So it's a picture of Renata and Olivia with a verse, prayed over her when she was little. Here's a, here's a prophetic verse, put it on the wall. So now my son, and for all four of them, all four of our kids, <laughs> have these pictures. I mean, Dawson turned 17 in two days. He's, he's a hair under six feet tall. He's more manly than I am. He's got chest hair. I, I mean, he's like a dude's dude. <laughs> and he's got this picture of me, him. He's a baby, prophetic verse. Mm, I delight in you. You're my boy. I love you. I want you just to just think, what are the ways? Paul's always, I, 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 see, I see Paul always giving acceptance affection and affirmation, even in the way that he writes letters. So I'm saying, first of all, father to the son, but I just see Paul, even when he's looking in, when you read through the epistles, you can find him always giving shout outs, giving even like affirmation. I, you can't give enough verbal affirmation. You can't, you just can't. You can't hug him enough. You can't shout him out enough. Literally, I mean, honestly, I, I, I woke up this morning, I'm driving here from downtown Keizu, and I just, I'm just, Mm, first thing, call them. They're all sitting around a table eating breakfast together, and just and I'm just, what's up? I love you. Let's pray together. And I know when I tell this, people think, man, you guys are so Pollyanna. I can't believe you know. All right, that's fine. Here's here's the thing. I'm, I've gotten pretty bold on this. Like there was a season in my 20s where I was like, you know, preaching prayer meetings, and I was real kind of sweet on it. But in my 30s, when I'd seen God do moves of God over the course of 20 years since junior high, because I started doing these prayer meetings when I was in junior high, I got pretty bold believing that prayer actually matters and that I, I've just seen God do enough, see it enough in the scriptures that I'm gonna just be kind of bold. And I just gotta warn you, like right now, I'm starting to not be quite as sweet. Hey, 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 I'm not saying this is how you should do it, but, but, but. I'm starting to kind of be like, nah, I just watched my dad go through I mean, 26 days in a COVID unit and I watched his kids rise up like intercessors and crowd to God and fast and pray and I saw a healing and I'm just a little bit bold like, hey, we gotta fight for these kids. 
We gotta fight for our families. And there is a way. I'm not saying it's the only way, but I'm saying there is a way. I'm saying we don't have to just punt and say, well, the devil's been working harder on my family than yours and I'm gonna give up. Oh, I'm, no, I'm just saying have a strategy, have a plan. All right, so just say that. So affection, acceptance, affection, and affirmation. Um, and I'll just give you this. My dad loves to tell the story about his dad. So I'm telling you about my dad taking me out one-on-one. Now, I do that with my kids, but you know his dad did that with him? His dad had a shock. My, my dad was born in Butte, Montana, and uh, they had my dad when they were in their 40s, so he was a whoops baby. And uh, they had, my dad had sisters, and then this years later, they had this little boy. But my granddad was born in 1905, uh, he loved my dad. He enjoyed my dad. And not even with a biblical worldview, just with being a guy that was a general manager at a grocery store, started taking out my dad one-on-one. And my dad tells the stories of his dad taking him out one-on-one in that solo time, just listening, talking. For him, he tells the story about going to Dairy Queen and going to the airport and watching the planes take off. That's, and I just want to invite you to this. I just want you to know, I do see, if you look at your parents, you look at even your situation, it's easy to have a reason why, man, we got a broken thing in my past. This sounds kind of dreamy, David. Well, let it start with you. Let, let, let you, you, you go after your kids, let your grandkids tell the stories about what you did with your parent, with, with their parents. You know, like my, I just want to invite you just to, get, just to get this vision. I just feel like I just hang out with pastors all the time, and they're just... I was sitting with a pastor last week, and he's crying. I mean, guy pastors. I mean, this guy, thousands. And th- I mean, it is a big... It's a monster church. And I'm, I'm sitting there talking to him, and we're just working on his kids. And he's just... And he's in tears. And he just says, I'd give anything to run this back. I'd give anything if I could have these kids after God. So I'm looking at some of you, and you guys got young faces. And I just want to invite you just to think. Let's, we got one shot. In my 50s and 60s, I'll still be a pastor, right? I'll still be pastor in Radiant Church in Kansas City. But my babies will be grown up. I got one shot. I ain't going to mess it up. I just want that in you, you know? And I got one shot. I got 18, 19, 20 years with them. I'm going to work on this. I had one pastor say this to me. He said, uh, David, you talk about raising family. Sounds like a a part-time job. I said, oh, it's not part-time. It's full-time. I got two full-time jobs. I pastor my family. I pastor my church. That's it. Someone said, yeah, in order to be healthy, you need a hobby. I said, I do have a hobby. Dawson, Liv, Adeline, and Just. Right now, that looks like Dawson loves revival. Saturday night, this last Saturday night, I, so we, we have a 5 a.m. wake-up call to do a uh, load-in for our portable church. And uh, this last Saturday night, I, I, I see a light on, and it's after midnight. And I walk in, and I go, Doss, what are you doing? you got to go to bed. You're getting up in four and a half hours. And he's like, Dad, just one more chapter, just one more chapter. I'm like, no, what are you reading anyway? Holds up Reese Howell's intercessor. You know what he's reading before that? Leonard Ravenhill. Why Revival Terry's. David, you got lucky. I don't know, maybe. Kind of feel like the people that pray see the most coincidences. I kind of feel like the people that are intentional see God work. I'm not saying, I know, I know I say this. I got a lot of you thinking, man, this guy's cocky. I'm not cocky, I'm desperate. I just want to be real. I want to give you more than principles. I want, to, I want to grind it in so that you walk out of here like, I really think there's some merit to what that guy was saying. So, but my dad tells the story of his dad loving him. His dad, my dad grew up in a small church in Montana when he was eight years old. He took his marbles to church and uh, he collected marbles. Like, we've come a long way when I think about my eight-year-olds with iPhones my dad, all he had was marbles, um, slanted floors, wooden floor, wood altars at the front. 
And in the middle of the sermon, my dad dropped, he was trying to look at them in the hymnal, and he dropped the marbles, and they went, <laughs> hit the ground, interrupted the, the preacher. They, the marbles rolled all the way down to the front, then it hit the altar at the front. Pow, 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 pow. <laughs> super stern, like super tall preacher leans over the pulpit. He's like 5'8". And he's like leaning, oh, just kidding, sorry. Uh, he's like, <laughs> it's tall to me. Mm. Oh, to be 5'8". Jesus. I still believe. You can heal my dad. You can grow me taller. Three inches, baby. Anyway. And uh, preacher stops the sermon, stares at my dad. Back in those days, they had an organist on the stage. The whole time in the sermon, she stops. She stares at my dad. The whole I mean, every, I mean, literally, the, the whole thing stops. And my dad says he just, like, eight years old, just kind of slumped down and uh, looked up and could feel this hand. My grandpa, my granddad, who was 5'4", baby. So, uh, I got an inch on him. Next generation, to go on the next level. Anyway, uh, hand right there on my eight-year-old dad with his eyes straight ahead at the preacher. And my dad tells the story about the moment that he felt like his dad loved him when no one else did. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You got these moments. For me, that was 16 mullet rejected by girls. Mm. You got these moments. And you want to be the one that shows affection, acceptance, affirmation when they're feeling rejected. And so I want to invite you just to think, okay, center of that target is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show that. I'm going to have that kind of relationship. Um, last idea, and then we'll, go, then we'll go a little more practical, is fight for their hearts. Fight for the hearts of your kids. Um, I was, we were on a family bike ride, and... Uh, my, my daughter, Addie, starts singing the song. She starts singing, take me to church, you know, and I'm like, what are you singing? And she's like, Dad, this would be a great, this would be, this would be a, so you got a picture of six of us riding a bike, and she starts singing the song. She goes, Dad, this would be a great new series for you at church. It's a great song. Take me to church. And I'm like, huh, okay. So I go Google. <laughs> yeah, take me to church. And you know what I realized? Um, they were not, he's not talking about church in that song. And I realized um, culture's after my kids. Somebody's going to make disciples of my kids. It'll either be me or somebody else. I say, Adeline, where'd you hear that song? Oh, I heard it in the mall. I heard it in the coffee shops. So you'll either make disciples of your kids or somebody else will. Their friends, the internet, TikTok, everybody's coming after them. So you're making, you're making the choice on if you're going to, if you're going to have a strategy, if you're going to have a plan. And I think of most parents, and I, when I look at most of them, they're not, when I look at what I was telling you about Jesus, um, and Jesus being relational with his disciples, most of my buddies are authoritarian with their kids. Like they're, uh, they just, they got a lot of rules. It's my house, my roof, you're going to live here, you're going to do it this way. And that, that you, can, you, can, you can lead your kids all right when they're young that way, when they're really little. But you'll probably start to lose them when they're in high school, maybe junior high. Um, I'm not a big fan. I, I've got some buddies that have been passive. And, you know, I'm 44 right now, so I'm watching some of, even my friends uh, have, I'm at the age where some of my friends' kids are graduating from high school. By passive, I mean some fathers that I just see that they're, they, they, the mentality that I see is I'm so busy, my job requires so much, the, the bills, the taxes, the yard, um, maybe even some hobbies. I'm just going to be a little bit passive. Um, I'll just tr- I, and, and the language is never I'm going to be a passive father. The language is I'm just going to trust God. Um, but in my view, I, I feel like I've watched uh, that be a little bit... Um, I've watched the kids not necessarily respect their father the same way as someone who's intentional because it just seems like they're just 
hanging out. And my invitation to you would be, as a mother or a father, would be to be a relational. So you can maintain authority, and you can trust God, but have a strategy, have a plan. Um, and that's my, my win for you, my goal. And I'm going to give you seven ideas um, on things that, that we do. And this is not what my parents did. This is what we do, and I'll just let, let you run with it, decide if you like it or not. Number one is daily time alone with Jesus. That's our goal. If my kids know God, I win. If my kids walk with Jesus, I'm not convincing them to not engage in premarital sex. They've already decided that. If they're walking with Jesus, I'm not looking at them telling them how much they can be on Instagram and how, who not to DM. You get a lot when you get your kid just in love with Jesus. And so most people are going after behavior Big win is to go after their heart. Go after their heart. Where's their affection? You start figuring that out when they're four. Start figuring that out when they're five, six. All four of my kids, massively different. So the play that I'm running with Doss is different than the play I'm running with Liv. Different than the play I'm running with Adlin. And different than the play I'm running with Just. But I'm running a play on all of them. I'm studying them. I'm getting a PhD in Just right now. He's 11. He's different than uh, Doss. Addie's different than Liv. Liv's, Liv is quiet like her mom, and I thought she was going to be a little bit of an introvert. Turns out she was an introvert in elementary, but she ain't an introvert no more. <laughs> you know? She's 15. She's ready to take over the world. Renata and I left town um, last week, and we realized after we were gone, every report we got, my parents were watching the kids, every report we got back, we were like, Liv made that choice. Liv's running the house right? She's a leader, okay? So I'm, here's, here's, it's really easy for us when it comes to parenting. Just sit back. Here's what I want to invite you. Here's the center of the target, their relationship with Jesus. So I'm frugal. I, 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 I don't let my kids put cheese on their burgers because I'm not paying that extra dollar for cheese, <laughs> right? Like, I, well, I'm frugal, but I just bought my daughter a $60 prayer journal. Liv got the nicest prayer journal you ever saw. You know? Why? Because I'll pay any price for that. I'll pay any price. So, you want to, what youth conference you want to go to, girl? What Bible you want? Sometimes I'll take my kids on our Sabbath and I'll just say, you can go spend as much as you want in that Christian bookstore helping your relationship with Jesus. Highlighters, pens, Bibles, let's go. So my kids think that I am the most frugal person when it comes to food and clothes. But they're like, he's crazy when it comes to resources. Why? Center my target. Mm. I don't give a rip about their clothes. I don't care if they're eating. I mean, Renata cares about what they eat. But I... I, I, Window into my soul. Here's number one. So what we do is we invite them when they were when they were little kids. I mean, f- f- so my kids because they're closer together. Each story you got to figure out how it works for you with your kids, different ages. We started working on their time alone with God. What does it look like? And so buy them journals, buy them Bibles, and then for us we had a, a time where they spend time with Jesus. We homeschool. Um, we didn't homeschool because we were afraid of the big bad world. We homeschooled because we want to be intentional about them having enough time with God. I just, I just look at it, I got, I got 18 years of formation. And so I'm not scared. I went to public school. I, I was a youth pastor for 16 years-ish. My brother says I was half partial youth pastor. But anyway, I, I, I think I was. And I, I, I'm, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of the big bad school. But I got this little window of time. So that enabled them to be with Jesus. That enabled them to have these long extended time alone with God. So big win for us is spending time alone with Jesus. Um, I got a lot there. I could, uh, I, 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 I'll tell you what I teach them. I, I, I taught my kids to do five things in their prayer journal. Um, there's, I want to invite you to have a way. You don't have to do it my way. One of, one of the ways that, um, the way that I teach my kids is the way that my dad taught me. So I teach my kids to start off writing out praise to God, and that's who is God. Thanksgiving, God, thank you for my family. 
Thank you for my church. Thank you for this house. You know, when uh, we worked at the mega church, thank you for the mega church. Now it's God. Thank you for the trailers. Portable's awesome. You know, thank you. Whatever has breath, I'm gonna thank God. Confession, God. Here's where I missed the mark. Here's where I need you. Then scripture. I just invite him to read some scripture, and then to look at the future, the next 24 hours. Vision. Here we going. Where are we going? God, what have you called me to do in the next 24 hours? Now, Renata and I, we've, we've leaned into that heavy in some seasons. We've pulled back in some seasons. We're not trying to have it be a legalistic plan. Some people say, hey, if you have a plan, it's just legalism. We would say, no, we think it's love. We just want to help our kids have a way. I'm amazed how many parents say, hey, go have that Devo, and they just buy somebody else's Devo, somebody else's journal. They haven't taught their kids how to connect and really know God and walk with Jesus. I want to invite my kids to have a real dialogue with God. Or they spend time with them. They know them. They walk with them. They've got conversation. So, so when we have conversations, we're talking about what God's saying. It's not just, it's not just the circumstance. It's what God is doing in their heart. Uh, so number one, that's, that's our win. Time alone with Jesus. And, and you really, if you can get that even in their, in their psyche when they're zero to five, that's big. That's, you've got control right then. Five to 12, you're training. Ages five to 12, that's your training season. You're, let's, let's get them ready. Because then... 12 to 19, they got a lot of free will in those ages. That's when you just stay close. That's when you're like, I'm in the coaching phase. So you're, you're in the control phase, zero to five. You're in the training phase, five to 12. These are just guesstimates, but this is what I see. 12 to 19, I'm, 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 still, I'm still coach, I'm still trained, but it's, it's friendship um, because you're helping them think. Second thing we do, is, is daily meals. Now, when I say this, I'm going to say daily and know that when I say daily, it's not 100%. I'm here today. I'm not there. But I would say it's 75%. All right? So we try to have one meal together. Some of you go, that's impossible in my world. Just catch the spirit of a strategy and you put a strategy that works together for you. This is what Renata and I put together. Here's the, here's the goal for our daily meals. Just dialogue. So we have a lot about Jesus. Daily meal, this is our moment. We just try to listen. And try to not dominate the conversation. Our family meals are our kids laughing, telling stories, and our four kids are best friends. I know right now I can feel it. All oh, this guy thinks he's the big no. I'm just I am telling you this because I'm 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 just I spent last week with one of my best friends talking about his kids, and I'm just I just believe it. I just watch my mom and dad do it. I just believe this. So we have this great. We do have. Sometimes we can't have dinner together because we have. So many night activities, so we bump it up at it. We figure it out. We, we'll do lunch or breakfast. We'll figure out a way to have a meal together. And the goal of the meal is relationship. It's not where I'm teaching them the Bible. The goal is where we're just being together. Third, we do daily tribal Bible. I made that up. We are on sabbatical 2008, and uh, I was trying to get my kids to spend time in Bible study. This is, the word didn't work. So we just did, I call, started calling Bible study, tribal Bible. I started giving out, fr- I took them to, on our vacation, went to the grocery store. They all picked out their favorite candy and I literally um, tricked them into studying the Bible. You get a question right, you get an M&M. You get a question right, you get a Snickers. You get a question right, you get Reese's Pieces, right? And I got my kids addicted to sugar and Jesus at the same time. <laughs> We're having conversations about, about the scriptures and working on it. My goal right there is just trying to help them to get, get, so we do, we, do a, we do a 25 to 30 minute tribal Bible. When I say this, this, we don't do it on Sundays. We don't have every day, but we get a lot of days. So you aim at, you aim at nothing, you're gonna get nothing, but you aim at 100%. For us, we don't even try Sundays. Sundays is our day. We lay it all on the field for church. But we hit these other days. All right, um, and this is a big one for us, but number four. So number one, their time, your kid's time alone with Jesus. And again, it's not about the time. You want the relationship with Jesus. That's the big win. The daily meal. You do the habit. You create habits. You form habits, and then your habits form you. It's not about the habit, but the habit that, the, of the daily meal helps the relationship with the family. The tribal Bible helps the word of God be a part of our conversation and the word of God in our kids. And it helps me know what's going on in their lives because they got a lot more going on than I know. They're, they're, they're connected to the entire plan. Our kids are on online school. So I said homeschool. That's not a good word. Homes, uh, online school. You know what that means? DMing people in Europe. That means my kids are connected to the globe, right? So, I, so I, it's, my, it's my opportunity to stay close. What's going on? Where are we at? 
What are we believing? What are we thinking? And help them get a biblical worldview. So fourth one is weekly special time. So with, the, with my sons, I call it dude time. My daughters, we call it special time um, or dates. Renata calls it special time for all four. Both Renata and I intentionally take our kids out one-on-one every week. And that's, to me, to me, that's the habit that has been um, so special and unique. Because that one-on-one time, depending on how many kids you have, it's different. That one-on-one time is prized by my children. Like my kids, my, honestly, my kids don't ask for things. They're not like, hey, dad, I need more clothes. My, they'll, they will say, hey, dad, uh, what are we going to do for a special time? Can't wait for a special time. Dad, can't wait. So, and for us, for Renata and I, it's either a walk or what we have found is we t- get in the car and we just have a budget. We used to have a budget. Now we bought the Panera subscription. That helps. We, it's like Panera for me and you get a treat. So for years, I would do this talk and I would say, hey, I, I do like, you know, two bucks for you and I drink a water. Not no more. Now, two bucks for you. And I get a decaf at Panera, and we sit and we talk. But that Panera, that, you know when Jesus, Matthew 16, when he's sitting around the lake, the, when they came to Caesarea Philippi, and he's sitting around the fire, he's talking to his disciples. Panera, that's our fire. That's our, that's our little place. Let's talk. Or the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus is always talking to Peter on the shores. Do you love me? Do you love me? So often asking questions. That's my Sea of Galilee. That's the shores for me, Panera. Hey, Adeline, what's going on? She's 13. Whew. She's blonde. Whew. It's going to be a long run for me the next five years. Right? I mean, she's a, she's a gorgeous little girl. And I'm right now in the thick of what's going on in your heart. Let's be together. Let's talk. So those special times. If I can go back and give testimony, that's what changed my life. When I told you the story at the beginning about my dad and, at Bennigan's, that, though, I could give you more stories and I have lots of them and I do tell them, but those one-on-one times was where the disciple maker Jesus used his disciple maker, Hal, to make a disciple out of David. So my dad made a disciple that's making disciples. So now my son, Dawson, and my dad, Hal, are best buddies and they're talking the same talk. You want to know why? Because my dad put it in me. I put it in my boy. And my boy's quoting back to me the things I used to hear from my dad when I was 16. And it doesn't all work out perfectly. And yeah, there's a little theological nuances. And I'm not the exact same person. Doctrinally, I might be a little bit different than my dad. But relationally, 100%. All in, baby. It's all in. Let's know Jesus and walk with him. And so I just think it's multi-generational. I want to invite you just to think, what could it look like? So I told you that story about, you know, Debbie on Monday, David on Tuesday, Dana on Wednesday, uh, Deborah on Thursday, and Dan on Friday. And so for me, in my season, I, I, we've moved around. My, my church, like, and my kids' schedules change. So that's one thing that isn't as left brain systematic. And my, my kids' days have fluctuated. We've changed them up. We're not in, we, every semester... We have to go back and kind of reframe, but we've got a plan. Renata and I, Renata spends time one-on-one. And there are things, one of the things that, I didn't have it with my mom when I was growing up, this kind of one-on-one, but Renata has it with each one of our kids. And the kind of relationship that Renata has with our sons is unreal. Just because their whole lives, one-on-one, talking, engaging. So special times uh, is number four. Number five, habit is we do, we do weekly Sabbath. So for us, that's Friday. Um, our kids do all their schooling Monday through Thursday. Um, Friday is we pray and play. That's the way we say it. Uh, the, we, the book that helped us in 2008 was by Mark Buchanan, The Rest of God. And The Rest of God, it, and, and so we do two things, pray and play. For us, I don't know what you, this is, this is how we do it. We have found the idea of Sabbath is that you live from a place of rest. So, you, so you're looking forward to Sabbath and you're living from Sabbath. So you live in a rested place rather than a weary place. So for us, um, Sabbath has been, um, my, like my kids when they were little, they would, they, they would say the word Sabbath. It's like their favorite word because um, 
we would, for us, like we let them get up late. We take our Bibles and journals and highlighters and we go to a coffee shop. I, honestly, this is a place where I told you, uh, this is where I'll spend. So we go to, uh, I mean, like a hipster coffee shop. I buy my girls a $5 latte for real and then let them sit there with their $3 croissant because they're sitting there with their journal open, their Bible open, and for the first hour, they're just, they're just spending time with God. Then we come back together. We talk, we talk about what the Lord's doing in our hearts, how our weeks have been, what we're thinking as we go into this next week, what's big, what's, what's big going on with our family, with our church. And then you know what you're doing. You're asking questions. You're not commanding. You're just saying, hey, Liv, have you ever thought about teaching in kids? Hey, Adeline, how do you think that relationship is playing out in your life? You think that's a godly friendship? What do you guys think? Oh, Ad, we think. Hey, Justice, love the way that you serve here. Have you ever thought about being a part of a small group? Hey, Justice, what do you think about if you, you get the idea? And then we just play. So we do two hours at a coffee shop. And then honestly, I want my family to be the place where they think of as fun. Right now, my kids, I, I, I'm, not, I'm, just, I'm just telling you, right now I had one of my kids turn down prom to go hang out with our family. That's a good day. That just happened this spring. Why? I'm just committed. I, I don't spend money on a lot of things. We got a pretty regular house. We got some old school cars, but we, we got some nice journals. We spend some, we, 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 we spend time with God and they got some nice stuff. They get you some great food and then we play hard. I took my kids and on, on, a, on Sabbath, I'll, I'll drop a dime. I'll, because Why? Man, I want our family is more fun than those friends. So they, they don't think of my family as legalistic, boring, ugh, Pollyanna, frustrating, annoying. No, they're like, if anybody likes to play, it's dad. And this is a fun place to be. So we pray and play on Sabbath. Honestly, if you can get that, change our lives. Sixth, Saturday night communion. Uh, we take communion with our kids every Saturday night. Um, and just say, uh, at our church, we call the volunteers the dream team, but our kids helped plant the church. They drove from Colorado on I-70 to go plant the church, and so we call them the supreme team. So we tell them that we have a supreme team meeting every Saturday night. We pray for the church, and then we're going to go on mission on Sunday. We take communion, and they lead the communion now. I led it their whole lives, but now I don't lead it. Um, we've passed it off. One kid opens in prayer. One kid does the scriptures. One kid passes out the elements, um, and then one kid leads the song. And then they just kind of rotate. Um, and so communion's led by, by the kids. Renata and I just sit there. That's pretty quick, but it helps all of them get on mission for Sunday. Oh, yeah, this is why we do this. We planted this church together. This is our church. All right, guys, this is not mom and dad's church. This is our church. You the supreme team. Liv, you're going to take a risk in preaching kids? Addy, oh, you say, it's in... You're with me. Seventh one is this. is date night and then for us, working date. Here's what that is. Renata and I, we do, uh, we do our date night on Sunday night. And for us, that's putting our marriage first. Um, and that's, a, that's just your typical date night where it's all about our relationship. And then we do a working date night. Uh, or sorry, a working date on Wednesday afternoon where we... That's where we go through business. What we found was, on, as I don't know how many of you are senior pastors, or we found ourselves just working on the church or working on our family the whole time on our date night. And so we decided to create two dates. So we bring our, our iPhones, iCal, and we'd spend an hour a week where we talk about budgets, who we want to hire, all, all the, and for one hour a week, it's all that. So that then on our, on our actual date night, we can just look at each other and say, baby, I love you. 21 years. Let's keep going. Let's make it another 30. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus, uh, for each of these pastors, their families. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that each kid would be a disciple. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would help them. Lord, I pray for strength. Every house, a house of prayer. Every house full of disciples. I pray, Lord Jesus, that in these, in these precious years they have with their kids, or that you would give them the strength to be the fathers, mothers, disciple makers that you've called them to be. Bless them. Bless these kids. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming.